one last little thing to touch on before we can get back to our, our more traditional management conversations. But um, yeah, so one, one last thing to finish up this sort of physical oceanography stuff. I uh, want to talk about some of the, the cool uh, structures that we see in the water. So not only can that different density lead to movement, it can also set up, uh, if, if, the, if the forces are relatively consistent, it can set up some, some consistent over time um, layering or structure to the ocean, so-called stratification. Uh, let, me, let me discuss walk you through this figure so we're all clear what we're, we're talking about here. So this is a profile of the water column, meaning, meaning a, an attempt to get an entire picture, just like if you, if you sketch my profile, right, my head to toe, same kind of idea. We're trying to do the same thing here, but in this case, instead of the outline of, of my face or whatever, we're looking at some physical aspect of the water column. In this case, this first one, we're looking at temperature. There's lots of ways you can do that. You and I can put on you know, swimsuits and jump in the water and, and go measure it by hand. Typically, though, we drop a, a probe of some type into the water. There's various ways you can do that. Um, we have devices in the other lab if you guys want to see some of that stuff. And, and in fact, it sounds like we're calibrating our are one of our uh, fancy water quality probes. So if you guys want to learn how to calibrate water quality probes, you can hang out after <laughs> class today. Um, uh, old school, here is, this picture is an old school picture, how you could do it with very simple technology. So in this case, this is a leaded line, a weighted line, that, so the, the bottom of the, of the rope will sink to the bottom of the ocean, and then we're holding onto it at the, top, at the boat. And then at equal distance spaced on there, we've tied different thermometers. And you could just throw a regular thermometer on, but then when we pull it, drop it in the water and pull it back up, it's going to change. So you can actually have little bubbles set in that thermometer that will max out. So we can record the max and the min temperature very easy. We've been doing this for uh, over 100 years, right? 150 years. So you don't need modern, fancy electronic stuff. That's nice, but you don't need that. So what we've done here is we've dropped our magic rope down to the bottom of the ocean. And in this example, it goes down 3,000 meters. And each of those little dots, we've recorded the temperature. So as I mentioned before, um, here on our, on our plot here, here's our x and y axis. Here on this y axis, we're going from zero or, or, or zero depth distance into the ocean, and then relatively deep or a high value down here. And then on the x axis, like traditionally, uh, we start from zero or low value, and then as we go to the right, it's getting higher. So if we look at this water, what we see is, okay, right here we have uh, a certain we, relatively warm water, relatively warm water, relatively warm water. Over here, we have relatively cold water, relatively cold water, relatively cold water. And the transition from that warm to hot is a relative, it's always a relative thing, but it's a relatively narrow band. So check it out. Over this little teeny distance, we've, got, we've dropped 20 degrees. Uh, Celsius. And that is real. So we see clines or change in conditions in the ocean all over the place. This one is a temperature climb. So we refer to it as a thermocline. Again, decline is just change in or difference. This is really, really real. So when I was, uh, when I was a undergrad like you guys, and I would work on my, my friend's research project, my graduate student friend's research project, uh, he loved gobies. So we studied gobies a lot. Um, not that I don't love gobies, but he really loved gobies. He has a goby named after him. He's so goby philic. Uh, anyway, so, um, so we would do this behavior. One of the, one of the many things that we studied was, was how these critters reacted to different habitat. So we'd, we made these model reefs in the bottom of this cove out in the Channel Islands, off Catalina Island, and we would sit there for hours on end on a scuba, and you'd float, and you couldn't move, right? Because so the idea is you don't want to spook the fish. You'd sit there, and I'd float like this, and I'd just you know, make little tick marks on my slate that, that one you know, f swam off the bottom. One tried to eat some food. One went in a hole. Like, and you say, tick, 
tick, tick, tick, tick, right? And so uh, that's super interesting <laughs> for the first 10 days. <laughs> And then the rest of summer, you're like, oh boy, I get to watch the fishy do the thing, right? So, um, uh, you know, still way better than office job, don't get me wrong. But, um, but it w so this was typically at about 30 feet in this, in this cove. And it's summertime, it's, it's California, so it's relatively warm water. But no matter who you are, y you will get hypothermic in the ocean water because it's lower than our body temperature and our, and our skin is in contact with the water, right? even with wetsuits and stuff on. So a lot of times what I would do to warm up, and then you know, you're writing, and so your hands need to be warm. When your hands get really cold and stiff, you, you can't write well. So many, many days, the thermocline was just above my head. So a lot of the times when my hands are feeling cold, without moving anything else, I just put my hands up like this, and my hands would be in maybe five degree warmer water. So the thermocline would be maybe from the top of my head like three or four inches, and then I'd be in another mass of water. So these thermoclines are really, they're, they're real, and again, it can be a very small distance. So, so, so we see things like this in the ocean. We see, and then because it's different thermal masses, we know, or different water temperature, we know that that corresponds to different, a, a different what? Different density, right? Different density. So, <clears throat> We can, we, there's all kinds of climbs. There's uh, cl uh, climbs in salinity, climbs in temperature, etc. And so <clears throat> you can see that right here. So here at the surface, which is the, again, this is our, 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 theoretical, our theoretical ocean here. So here we have uh, surface water, relatively warm. That's where the sun is. The sun's warming up our, our water. Down deep, there's no sun, so it's relatively cold, relatively cool. And so uh, really, uh, there's, a, there's some layer near the surface where it's pretty homogeneous, pretty much the same. When we change depth or we go farther into the ocean, there's no real change in the parameter we're measuring. Then we hit the cline, and there's a rapid change over a relatively small uh, distance. And then we hit this other mass of water, and when we continue to go farther in, there's no change in that variable. And so again, you guys, we see it as temperature, but it manifests as density. And this, this will vary a little bit with, with, uh, with uh, again, where we are on the planet with the strongest clines where the, where the sun creates the strongest temperature differences, and that's gonna be at, at the tropics. And the least uh, intense clines uh, in terms of temperature, at least in terms of thermoclines are at the, in the polar regions. And yeah, let's leave that. Okay. So this is different than what happens in most of our lakes in the world. So most of our lakes tend to um, have uh, small um, thermoclines and they tend to mostly manifest themselves in the summertime. Uh, well, in the northern, I should say in the northern hemisphere, they manifest in the summer times. And these down deep in the ocean, these thermoclines, or excuse me, down deep in the ocean, we can have these thermoclines all the time. In the ocean, they really, they, they don't seem to exist so much. So lakes, different phenomenon than what's going in in most of our ocean, because our ocean has this much larger volume, much larger thermal inertia than a lake. Okay, so uh, just keeping that idea about temperature, here is, so, so here's, here are those big circulation patterns we talked about before, right? Northern hemisphere, the, the, the large mass of surface water is mostly moving in a clockwise, clockwise direction, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. And this is what that translates into. So this is, so we're looking at a time lapse of the temperature of the surface of the ocean as measured through satellites. Remember we mentioned this before when we talked about hurricanes. Sea surface temperature is also called SST. And so we're seeing, we're, we're, we're marching through the seasons here and we see, so okay, now it's becoming summer in the northern hemisphere. Now it's uh, summer in the southern hemisphere, right? You guys get the, the, the heat waves moving up and down. But wherever we are, check it out. 
So here this tongue of cold is pulling down here. Tongue of cold pulling up here. And then when we go to the other side of the basin, we're going to see the tongue of warm mostly going up or down, depending on where we're talking about. So here we go. So here's that tongue of warm extending farther up than we, than we would otherwise guess and extending farther, a little bit confusing here to see in this image, but you guys get it? So surface, so temperature is another important variable in the ocean that explains distribution of critters, helps explain distribution of resources. Another one is going to be light. So light is incredibly um, uh, variable, or at least how it, how it passes through water, it can be variable. Clearly, the, most, the biggest reason we're interested in light is that is, and by light, we're, we're mostly talking uh, about the visual spectrum stuff, but even in the, in the visible and the near visible, so the, the infrared to ultraviolet type of range spectrum, um, the most important thing here is that that gives us photosynthesis, and that allows, that, that's the basis for most of our ecosystems on Earth. Right? Most of our ecosystems are solar powered through phytoplankton or through terrestrial plants that have chlorophyll and other light harvesting pigments that convert that sun energy into chemical energy, that radiative energy into chemical energy in the form of sugars and other high energy bonds. Uh, quick and dirty, we tend to refer to the ocean in the context of light as the photic zone or the lit zone and the aphotic zone or the zone of the ocean that's in darkness, the non-lighted uh, part of the ocean. This photic zone is not static. It can move up and down. Again, just like we talked about salinity being, being influenced by coastal processes like the Amazon and the Santa Clara River and stuff like that. Not only does that, do those rivers bring in fresh water and impact the salinity, also brings in sediment, dirt, stuff in the water, right? And so that's gonna act to interfere with light and that's gonna tend to, to um, uh, be expressed as we typically talk about turbidity. It's the amount of stuff in the water. So sediments near the mouths of river that's going to tend to make light not penetrate very far. Similarly, life in the way can impact that. And so we most typically think about that in the form of phytoplankton blooms or plankton blooms. So single-celled critters that become so numerous, they, 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 they can color the water and therefore uh, impact light penetration. Wa light penetrates exponentially into water. It decays exponentially into water. So it's not a linear die off. It's an exponential decay. Red wavelengths die the quickest. So red wavelengths disappear super quick, which is why when you look at an old, I should put a picture in here. When you look at an old National Geographic picture of Jacques Cousteau underwater, what does it look like? What do the pictures look like? Are they vibrant colors? No, they're kind of like muted tend to be really blue, overly enriched and bluish and greenish. Yeah? That's because, uh, well, one, because the film sort of sucked back then. <laughs> but also because there wasn't, there, there, the red light drops out first. So there's not much red. If you're at any kind of depth, if you're you know, 30 feet, 40 feet, the red is really, really disappears. And so even if you have film that's sensitive to red, if you're just using the ambient sunlight, there's not much red getting down to you. So one, the reason now if you see a photograph from a, a uh, you know, coral reef, it looks all vibrant. One, it's because we have better film or now you know, computer sensors that are more sensitive. But the other is that those are typically taken with flash photography. So they augment the white light. So they bring their own light down into the water. And so therefore, we can see the reds. Okay, red light drops off first, and then you can, as you can see on this diagram, then orange, then yellow, then green. So anybody a scuba diver here? Okay, anybody ever cut themselves at say like 90 feet? 40 feet. Uh, yeah, similar. So what is it? What, what color blood? What color is your blood? Um, it wasn't red. Uh, right, it's not red. 
So if you pulled out our flashlight and shined it on my cut finger at 90 feet, it would look red because right, we'd be bringing that the full white, the, the full um, spectrum there, and it would go. But but that that red wavelength drops out in the first 30 odd feet, or so we'll, we'll drop significantly out. And by the time you get to 90 odd feet, it's it's basically totally gone. That's right. Yeah, it'll look dark. Okay. It'll look dark. I mean, it'll first start looking sort of like dark purplish, and then it'll look darker bluish, and then yeah, then it'll it'll look optically black. But hold on, to that that's an excellent. That's the next point. That's an excellent segue. Um, uh, and then blue goes the farthest. Blue goes the farthest. And don't re and don't forget that the sun has also given us heat. Okay, uh, pressure is the next one. So we're talking about temperature, light, pressure. So this is something that we're not used to here. Where we are right now is at the surface of the ocean. We operationally define this as one atmosphere's worth of pressure. How much atmosphere is above us? Well, it depends on how we want to define the atmosphere. But, you know, we're talking on the order of, uh, again, depends on how you measure it, 50 to 100 miles of air above us, gas, gaseous atmosphere, essentially pulling down on you and I, on our lungs, on our, on our fingers, on our eyeballs, all that kind of stuff, squeezing us from all directions. That's one atmosphere's worth of pressure. <clears throat> to double that pressure on us, you need only go 33 feet or 10 meters into the ocean. And then you're going to double the pressure on you. This is why when you jump in the pool with some goggles or whatever, you start to feel a squeeze. Right, a little squeeze around your face. Um, I have a story about that too, but I, I'll tell you that later if you want. Um, so, so every every unit of ten meters or thirty three feet into the water is one additional atmosphere's worth of pressure. And what's the average depth of the ocean? Three point seven. There you go. Right. So that's a lot, whole hell of a lot of squeezing going on. Right. So you can illustrate that the easiest way you illustrate this is if we take a balloon. Okay, so we take a balloon, blow it up. So you and I are on the boat or at, or at the beach or whatever. So we, I give you the balloon, you blow on it, make it up, boom. Now it's, we, we you tie a knot in it, so it's sealed. There we go. And it's whatever the diameter is, one meter diameter. If we take that balloon and then we jump in the water and we free dive down, we swim down to 33 feet or 10 meters, the diameter of that balloon is going to be exactly one half. So it's going to be only a half meter uh, wide. And then as we continue to go in, it'll continue to be squished, or excuse me, continue to go deeper in the ocean, it's going to be squished more and more and more and more. So this is, this is all, there's all kinds of consequences for this. At, at the, the first, you and I putting on a scuba tank or free diving down, we feel the squeeze a little bit, right? But once we start going into these really abyssal depths, these really, really deep depths, the pressure is such that we can actually um, mess with proteins. And the, phys the physiological going on of our bodies can, you know, assuming that, assuming that we don't get crushed to death, if we have any air space, so you and I have lungs, right? Um, it, those lungs will be just be crushed at, at, at some point in the not too deep depths. But Beyond those depths, going in further, further down, we actually start seeing messing with Q10s and and photos and uh, physiological rates of processes of protein folding and stuff. So it can be totally crazy, totally crazy. Uh, then, yeah, okay, great. That's, yeah, questions about that? So then, if you were to have a fish that died on the surface and yeah. floated all the way down, it would be Ooh, so the question is, so if we had a fish that died here and went to the bottom, is he going to be super small? Probably not. Uh, if it was a puffer fish, which is most, and, and we freaked him out, he's like, oh, you know, and he's big and like a balloon, then he would be super crushed. But only if you have crushable tissues. So if you have air spaces, those air spaces, that's what's being crushed in the balloon, right? It, it's the gas is being compressed. So you and I, we have, let's see, we have air spaces in our sinus. So, the other thing is, if water is in there, it's not going to be squished, right? So the fish dies, and if he has a digestive cavity, 
and it fills up with water, he's not going to be squished. Because all his tissues are going to be squeezed equally, right? So, the, so, um, and so this is, this is a problem for scuba divers, right? Free diving, it's not that much of a deal. So we jump in the water, you and I, we have our air in our lungs, and we jump in the water, and we have our mouth closed, and we jump in the water, and we go down, and, and we'll, our, we'll feel some being, a little bit being squished, but it's not going to be the end of the world. With scuba divers, though, we carry our own air on our back. And so we have, a, we have compressed air. So how we breathe is we have a bunch of compressed air, and we have a valve thing that we have in our mouth, and we go, <gasps> and, this, and this tank shoots that air out and squeezes it and fills it up in our lungs. <sighs> cool. So we can breathe. The problem happens with scuba dive. Well, one of the many potential problems. But one of the problems is if we're down here at at three atmospheres, at 66 feet, I have to take you know, three times the amount of the air molecules into my lungs, right? Because I, I, need, to, I, I need three times the, the pushing back pressure of the sea around me, right? So that's fine if I'm at, if I'm at, if I'm at uh, 66 feet. But the problem is, now I want to go up. I'm going to go up there. So when I want to go up there, I need to make sure I keep breathing out. Because let's say, let, let's do the reverse of this experiment. Let's say this is where we started to fill the balloon. Everybody with me right here? Mm -hmm. Let's say we filled the balloon. I took, I took out, I, I had an empty balloon, and I had my, my scuba tank, and I had a little valve thing I could, I could put on the balloon. And let's say I filled up the balloon at this depth. Right? And then I tied it off in a knot, and I sealed it. So then if we went from here to here, it's going to increase. As we go from here to here, it's going to get bigger and bigger, right? If the balloon has the elasticity, it'll just get bigger. If the balloon doesn't have the elasticity, it's going to pop. So our lungs don't have that much elasticity. So if I started right here and I filled my lungs up with my compressed air, which is like three times too much air at the surface, and I just boom, held my breath and then rocked it to the surface, I would rupture my lungs. And then I'd probably die. Or you have what's called an embolism that could, that could come out and come underneath your skin, subdermal. It, it, there's all kinds of weird things that can happen. But they're not good. They're all bad. So, but that's all happening because the things we're talking about are, are, are spaces being squished. So with the default, your example fish, the fish it might, it might have a swim bladder, which is a, which is a, a bag of gas that helps them stay buoyant. Some fish have that. That's a problem. And where we see that happening is if we're doing a net tow and, and we drag our nets through the water and then we pull the nets up really fast. A lot of times the fish are ah, ah, it, it looks like he's gagging and it's because his swim bladder, which is an internal organ, has gotten, the, the, the air pressure has gotten so much bigger. It's, it's not like you're not, it's not like our lungs, not, you're not like in, going in and out. It's physiologically controlled. So the, so the gas can't just you know, flood in, flood out the thing just pops super big and it'll come out their mouth. So a lot of times you want to save that fish, you take, we typically have things like a hypodermic needle and you pop his swim bladder and throw him back in the water. And sometimes they die, but a lot of times they'll actually live if you do it quick enough. So they won't feel good and they'll have a hard time swimming because their, their, their flotation device is effed up until it heals, but they won't, they don't necessarily die. And so, so the rest of their tissue is fine with going up high, low. It's just that, it's just that airspace is the problem. Good question. Other questions? Okay. All right. So to finish this up, let's just talk a little bit about uh, some circulating, some circulations of the Earth. This is so the last thing we want to talk about are things like apparent forces, such as our Coriolis, uh, Coriolis effect, the 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 flush in the toilet thing, right? That everyone thinks it's not the flush in the toilet thing, but everybody miss. Miss uh, associates that. Okay, so this is this is an idealized Earth with no rotation. So if we were if we were a magic Earth and we weren't spinning around our axis, this is what would happen, right? We have our equator. Um, we would have the now in this case we're talking about winds now instead of water, but same basic idea. But let's just talk about winds. So we, what happens is uh, the the cold air is so so the sun is hitting us at the equator, so it's the hottest at the equator. The equator, that heat makes the gas lighter, less dense. It's going to tend to rise at the poles, the least amount of heat. 
That's going to tend to be relatively cold. That's going to tend to be more dense. That's going to tend to sink. We're going to tend to get these winds. Everybody with me? So we have this, this sun-driven wind phenomenon. But then we're actually spinning around our axis. So we're spinning around our axis. So, so that, this is happening right now, day in, day out, this, this tendency uh, rising at the equator, sinking at the poles. But now we're going to be spinning. You and I are going to be moving underneath that wind. right? So the, 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 the surface of the orange that you and I are living on, we're going to be moving through those wind fields. And this acts to create the so-called this is the classic Coriolis effect. It's not a real force. It's not real. It just seems like it's real to you and I because we live on the ground. To an observer above the merry-go-round, the path of the ball appears straight, while to someone sitting on it, the ball appears to curve to the left. This exemplifies the Coriolis force, whereby to an observer on the rotating Earth, the path of an object appears to be deflected, and this is a result of the Earth's rotation. You guys with me? Want to watch that one more time? <laughs> so check it out. So looking straight down, the ball doesn't curve, right? The ball, it's physics. It's pushing a force and it's going this way. It's because you and I are attached to the Earth and everything, and then the clouds and the wind look like, we all see it relative to us. That's where we get this Coriolis effect. To an observer above the merry-go-round, the path of the ball appears straight, while to someone sitting on it, the ball appears to curve to the left. This exemplifies the Coriolis force, whereby to an observer on the rotating Earth, the path of an object appears to be deflected, and this is a result of the Earth's rotation. Total sense, right? Super <laughs> simple. No problemo. Key thing is, the Coriolis is an apparent force. Okay? So in our day-to-day -day activities, we treat it like it's a force, but it, it just, it, it's uh, our perspective that makes us see that. So what this tends to do is this tends to sit up, set up these prevailing patterns where winds, which then in turn are going to influence the surface of the ocean, which then influence things like, oh, I don't know, empires, colonies, people fighting for each other for control of this earth, all that kind of stuff is set up to control things like trade routes. Back in the day before we, we and even, even now, even with all, our, even with all of our uh, fancy, fancy you know, uh, diesel engines and everything, we still benefit from following these routes where some places it's easiest if we want to go from say uh, the east to the west, we should go in this general area. Back in the day when we had sales, we had to do that, right? So therefore, Therefore, uh, if, you, if you're going to want to be a guy that's importing stuff that comes from the countries over here, this is a good spot to be in, right? If we want to return them, right, here's, here's another good spot. So this tends to set up all this socio-geopolitical structure on the earth and, and people enslave other people and, and all this kind of stuff um, in the locations they do because of the physics of how wind and water move around on the planet. So this is a figure I'll give you guys. I want you guys to, to uh, learn these. Um, this is a, a little bit of a strange diagram, so I just want to explain it to you. So here's the Earth. So this is, obviously this is the Earth. And this is sort of a, a, a cartoony version of the atmosphere, right? So this is trying to show you colder air sinking, you know, going this way, sinking. Warmer air heating up, coming this way, right? So we're creating these belts, these, these different bands of winds which is in effect creating different slices of the atmosphere or, or di different, uh, different latitudinal slices of the earth. And we've attached different names to these. So trade winds, um, uh, westerlies, uh, the jet stream is being shown right here. And it's, this is, it's hard to show all this in, again, it's a three dimensional process, hard to show it in two dimensions. But basically what we see is this is the, the general neighborhood of where the jet stream meanders around. And this, and this minus is meant to show the butt of the arrow, right? So the arrow is going into the, 
into the screen. So on this side, it would be coming out towards us, and, and the wind it would be going it goes like the jet stream goes like this, and then goes up to here and goes around the backside. The jet stream is but one example of this consistent structure we see in our atmosphere, and then in turn uh, influences the the surface of the ocean, etc. So from this, we can see, for example, why we tend to, as we mentioned before, we don't see hurricanes in this immediate area around the, um, the tropics because that's where the air is rising, and that tends to break up the formation of hurricanes. Or if one were to somehow magically form, it would, wouldn't last for very long. This also explains cold, cold falling, um, uh, Fall, falling air tends to explain where we get different bands of rainforests and things like that. The Pacific Northwest rainforest, the tropical rainforests, those kind of things, right, tend to have a, a lot of precipitation. And we have all these fancy names for it. Uh, you guys don't need to learn all those names, but you need, you need to know, know the, the, major, the major guys, the, the trades, the westerlies. In reality, it's, it's, so, so that's the simplification. In reality, there's lots of structure going on here. There's all kinds of movements of water, of air, um, and, and all that kind of good stuff. I'll just end by saying that there's, remind you guys that there is this three-dimensional structure. So the stuff I've been talking about, surface winds, surface currents, it gets really complex down deep. And um, I'll just mention one of these examples before we end, which is this so-called great conveyor. So, so there is movement. Some of that is fast. Some of that is slow. Some substances can move around the ocean basin, uh, not, not over across the surface of the water, but down deep. And so the, the, again, this is another one of those numbers that's hard to measure. It kind of depends on what, what element and stuff you're talking about and where you're talking about but we're talking about something on the order of um, of of thousands of years hundreds of thousands of years for something to cycle around the uh, from the surface waters to down deep to the tropics to you know b back and forward some things take longer some things in certain parts of the ocean have a lot longer residency time uh, others are are faster but in general this conveyor belt um, is a really important way to move things around, not only, not only energy that we mostly think of, but in some, time, some cases other things. This is becoming increasingly important in this era of trying to understand where our carbon emissions are going. The ocean has absorbed most of the carbon we've emitted from our society. A small amount of it's left in the atmosphere. The ocean has acted like a big carbon sponge. And so that's a, that's a big question. Um, and this is, this is one representation of the so-called great conveyor belt of stuff moving around through these different ocean basins. And I'll just show you this one image. So this is, this is one uh, conveyor belt in the North Atlantic. And so this is that warm water, right, coming up the east coast of the US. And then we're gonna see these glacials melt, glaciers melt. So one of the great concerns with climate change is stuff like this. So this, um, uh, the so-called the, the Gulf Current, right? This was, anybody know who first mapped that? Founding father, the US, what was the guess? Jefferson. Uh, not Jefferson, um, uh, Jefferson was interested in it. Um, <coughs> Uh, a kite with a key. Yeah, Ben Franklin first proposed this idea of a of a postal service and and and, and other things, and also figured out that he put floating bottles and and sort of tracked this the, the, this current that went up the east coast of the U.S. It was warm, right? One of the it sounds like a plot of a science fiction novel, but one of the real proposals that Hitler was working on in World War II was how to screw up this current. Because this current brings us warm tropical water and it bathes the east coast of the US. It also bumps around a little bit and tags Great Britain, tags the UK. Now, the UK is a cold place, but it would be even colder 
without this oceanic circulation. So Hitler wanted to freeze out the Brits. So he had researchers trying to figure out how they can break down this oceanic current. I mean, they obviously couldn't figure out how to do it. Congratulations, we figured out how <laughs> with climate change. So one of the worries is that if Greenland melts at too fast a rate, this lens of fresh water, which you guys now will understand, right, it's floating on the surface, might act to break up, to, to, to snap this conveyor belt. And that wouldn't stop the energy moving around the, wouldn't stop the energy moving around the world or anything, but it would complicate it. It wouldn't follow in this nice clean gyre. And so that would mean that the UK would suddenly become much colder, much, much colder. And that would have significant implications for the world economy, all kinds of stuff. So we'll watch that one more time here. So this is, this is just the condition now, the circulation now. And then what might happen were we to get enough of the, the glacial melt to enter the ocean, um, it can in effect act as a, as a break on that global circulation current, right? So again, this basic physics stuff, this basic oceanography stuff, which maybe sounds a little bit disassociated from our typical management conversation, actually really directly has to do with all this stuff. Has to do with where critters are distributed, has to do with where you and I want to move around the earth, has to do with where you and I want to live. And so all this stuff is important. I'll, I'll end this before we go on to our next topic just to say that there's all kinds of other complicating things that are going on. This was a super quick tour through physical oceanography, marine bio 101 kind of thing. But, but there's daily variation. There's, there's, there's more spatial structure than I've implied. There's annual variation. There's also these important things that we're now just realizing. So for now, just jot these down. These are, these are temporal patterns, cycles to our global and oceanic uh, climate that we still are learning about. The first is ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. You and I most typically see this as what we talk about as, as being El Nino years, which happen where we are here in California once every, on average, 7 to 11 years. There, there's variation, but something like that. And when that happens, we here in California get much wetter uh, rain conditions than under a quote unquote normal year. Other places in the globe get much drier. There's a thing called a PDO, same kind of idea, long term variation, but in this case, this is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. This has to do with oceanic climate and, uh, and, and goes on for, as the name implies, decades at a time. So there are times when it's really good for fish times when it's not good for fish. So we have relatively high fish populations, relatively low fish populations, separate from all the over harvesting we're doing with our fisheries. And then, uh, and then we also have something that we've now uh, observed in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, same kind of thing, North Atlantic Oscillation. And there's, uh, there's many, many others. Suffice it to say, there's lots of structure in our ocean and our, and our global systems that we're still understanding. We don't understand it all, but we have a, we're beginning to get a decent handle. So when you hear people talk about other scientists don't understand what's going on, it's true. We, well, we never will fully understand this stuff. We always want to know more. But it's not true to say that we don't understand some of the basic goings on. We might understand all of the drivers or all of this and that, but we understand a whole heck of a lot. And we definitely understand enough to know that there are some significant concerns with things like climate change, things like over-harvesting, things of that nature going on. Cool? All right. Everybody take a two-minute stretch.